Welcome to the Brickworks podcast, an extension of the studio based here in Burnham-on-Sea. Our aim for this podcast is to have a completely open forum for conversation. This could be about art, life, mental health, or even how the world is burning down around us right now. Whether you're listening to this whilst on a run or relaxing at home, we hope you enjoy our mild-mannered rambles. Thank you. Let's about. talk about how the world's gone to shit again already. And how I can't get my hair cut anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I was meant to get one tomorrow. And then um, they, put, they put us in tier four, so now I'm not going to be getting a haircut until, what, probably July now? Yeah, actually, so that's I'm a good be point. like Jesus. <laughs> Down so, here. Yeah, oh, mate, don't. Like, I, um, in the first lockdown, I like taught myself how to do my own hair. And honestly, the first like three cuts that I made... I did, yeah. It's not. It wasn't a good look by any means. I need to learn how to do a man bun. It's not quite long enough yet, and my mum keeps insisting to play put it, it in the man bun. I mean, I wouldn't. I don't mind that. It's just like I'd rather learn to do it myself or just get a grip. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or just you, let it go, full Boris. Full, please don't. <laughs> I swear to God, if the next time I see you, you dye your hair blonde, and I'll you dye like my hair Boris blonde. I'll walk into number ten. I'll probably do a better job with him with no experience. <laughs> Oh, mate, mate, I remember I had like a, do you remember the man bun was like a thing like a few years ago? Everybody had like a yeah. man bun. Mate, I jumped on that hype train like a motherfucker. You can like, look like a barista. Oh, mate, I still look like a barista, but just like I an mean, edgy one. Like, <laughs> I'm just not covered in tattoos. Not yet. <laughs> not yet. The time is- when they reopen, the time will be nigh. But um, yeah, I had like a, uh, like I couldn't ever get it long enough into like a full bun. Um, so I'd always have like the little samurai ponytail thing going on. Like that's probably what I'll end up with. Honestly, mate, I thought I looked good. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's not the worst thing that could happen. No, true. There's well, yeah, there is worse things happening right now, I suppose, rather yeah. than uh, samurai haircuts. I just need to inhale a thesaurus as well, and then I could probably get away with yeah. <laughs> being the new Boris. Well, you just have to be able to like bumble a little bit and then you yeah, can yeah, you can know. get there just like that <laughs> oh, rapscallions, uh, rapscallions. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so what's going on with you man i know you're uh you're working still you're still still busy Slaving with your away in sainsbury's uh, yeah man working on that zine still it's oh, meant yeah. to be coming out this month but i don't think it will anymore because i've can't be asked. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, no I, it's basically ready. I just need to get off my ass and get it printed. Yeah. Get it all sorted out because there's, there's there's a market for it. People are interested in it, but I just yeah, the motivation is gone. Yeah. Obviously, that's not universal. Well, it is universal. It's not just me. No, I think that's the thing, man. Is like uh, right now is such a hard time to stay motivated as a creative. Like. Yeah. And it's it's really frustrating because like there is so many stories happening around the country and politically, et cetera, et cetera. But it's like having the motivation to make anything of it is quite difficult. Yeah. But like you'll run me through your zine again because I remember you talking to me about it. So it is a collection of images that I shot on the estate that I live on over the past, well, it would have been 20, probably one and a half, two years. Mm. I haven't shot anything this year so far for it, and I don't think I will for it. And it's just basically a... I was originally going to try and do it as like an abstract look on a very boring housing estate, but it ended up being just a look at a boring housing estate. <laughs> but people like that thing, and it's a, not something that's really, I don't think, told, especially in the zine format. Because mm, mm. I remember you showing it to me when we were doing um, New Faces, Different Places. Printing you were, off, yeah. Yeah, I remember you sort of talking to me about it and that, like, you had already got an audience interested in, like, jumping on the Zoom. Two or three people. Yeah. Which is something. Oh, 100%. Like, yeah. nowadays, like, right now, just having anyone engaging with your artwork is, like, a good thing, I yeah, think. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I, I remember you sort of mentioning it to me uh, about the Zine. Because obviously, your work 
is very like uh, I'm going to butcher it now. New topographic. That is no, that is the term. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I haven't been in the photography circles enough recently to remember all Get the on sayings. Get and, on Twitter. Oh, mate, I need to, especially with everything going on with Magnum. I'm sure we'll get into that in a minute. But mm-hmm. um, no, it's interesting because like I think zines. Like, I've I've made a lot of zines in the past. Like whether they're DIY or professionally published, it's like they seem to be such an interesting form of expression with photography. Definitely. It's, um, it's your statement. It's how you make your, it's, it's how I see it at least. It's your first foray and your first like, this is me. Mm, mm. And you've got to try and make it, you've got to do it. I mean, the thing is with zines, you can get second chances and third chances or whatever, but like to try and get it right first time, it's, it's important. Yeah, totally. I like to think I've got it probably just about right because I'm doing something which I don't think I've seen done before. Mm. Which is like on newsprint, unbound, loose pages, quite big as well. Interesting. I was going to say, what's what's your approach to like the printing of it? Because obviously, there's a there's obviously two different types of approach to making any publication: yeah, yeah. the the do it yourself, whether you're printing yourself and mounting, or going and finding a publisher and going through like a professional source. I've set up a gum road. I'm ready to put the thing on, put the zine on there, sell ten of them. Cool. And then go through there, print it through a uh, the newspaper club, mm. and then send it over to me, mm. and then just distribute it myself. Yeah, the news cl- newspaper clubs are cool. One, like it does look really cool. I've been wanting to do something with them for a while. Yeah, yeah. I ordered the paper samples, and then like I don't know what it is about newsprint, but it's really like <laughs> it seems it's mm. really nice. Mm. And I think with my kind of work, it's, it's topographic. It's quite deadpan. The colours are somewhat muted. There yeah. are a few like stronger tones. Mm. I think newsprint would work in its favour. Mm. Yeah, I think like newsprint has always been an interesting one. Did you ever see um, Alex Soth's? Um, I'm gonna forget the name now, but he did a like a a, a, a news a newsprint. It was like a, he actually took over a newspaper. I don't think it was Songbook. That was actually a book, I believe. But I, I, yeah, he did something like that, and he like printed a lot of his work uh, that project onto newsprint i never got a copy because they were very limited yeah. and now they're se- selling for extortionate amount on ebay as is the way yeah once you're in magnum photography no, I'm joking. um <laughs> but um yeah i think newsprint is always a weird one with photography because obviously it's associated with press you know that fast yeah. turnaround news like that medium but also the colors that it produces and everything is drastically different to like printing on like a, a gloss paper or something like that Definitely. is that kind of as you mentioned then it sounds like that was kind of the way you wanted to go was like that more sort of matted down i suppose I'll like honest, image the first thought was doing it on newsprint would be cheaper Okay, <laughs> but then I realised all of the things that you were talking about—the colour and the, yeah. the texture, the thickness, how it feel in your hands, mm. the ability to stick it on your wall if you like it, mm. and having it unbound makes that possible. Mm. But the first, the first thought with me was, I wanted to make something. I wanted to do something last year. Obviously, that didn't happen, and I wanted to do it as quickly as possible. And I had a body of work and it was ready, and I'd edited it down. I've been working on it since September. Mm. I just wanted to get it out. And I thought that newsprint would be the best and most affordable way to do it. Yeah. And as it turns out, it's not. No? <laughs> no, there are other ways about it, but I don't like the outcomes. Mm. I've got my mind set on doing it on newsprint now. Maybe I'll do another project and I'll do it another way. Yeah. But this one is going to be newsprint. It's definitely something that like I've wanted to experiment with, like, but I can't seem to... I've got a friend, Alice, um, who's the journalist for the Weekly News, and uh, originally I was going to get her to give me the name of the supplier that prints their newspaper because I was going to try and get some actual paper that they use for their newspaper yeah. and try and do test prints here I never got around to doing it but it's definitely something that I'm interested in because of just like as you were saying like it's a very versatile way of printing something because it can be pinned up on a wall it can be you know screwed up it can be beaten up it could be it, turned into a ransom note it could be turned into a ransom note <laughs> interesting perspective yeah <laughs> that's an interesting one um and it just seems like a really interesting like form of expression and form of like showing work um i definitely want to experiment i just need the microphone nice. to anyone that's listening <laughs> apologies for that um Definitely something I want to ex- experiment with. Um, 
but yeah, it's it's a strange one because it's very easy to just end up doing the classical route of like, especially zine making, even though there's no such thing as a classical zine. But like, you know, the matte paper, staple bound is what I've primarily done with mine. So it's interesting that you've gone a different route with it. Yeah. That's what I've got to say, really. <laughs> I've so, not really been thinking about it recently. No? Uh, obviously, work. So yeah, yeah. This has been zapping me of any creative energy or thought yeah well we were saying just before we came on this is that like and this is no disrespect to anyone working retail or anything like that I Solidarity. To, yeah i know i have to disclaimer it um but <laughs> like i don't know if i think yourself would agree but like being a creative like naturally we want time and energy to be able to create but working in a job something like retail it, it feels like a prison sometimes <laughs> like it feels it can feel like a bit of a prison system it obviously has an end like you you need the money etc cetera, etc cetera, yeah. but like it does feel quite confining sometimes definitely although it's nice to know that the at least the majority of people maybe that i work with maybe it's the same elsewhere the majority of people are in the same boat and they don't want to be there there are some people that are there They've ended up being there longer than they intended to and they've stayed there because it's comfortable and it's a good source of income. That's fair enough. It works for them. I'm not going to judge them for it. In fact, I don't judge anyone that works in retail unless they mm. want to. In which mm. case, I want to say, what happened <laughs> to you? Where did your drive go? Yeah, yeah. But if it ends, if your situation changes and it can't be helped, then fair enough. But I know there are a few creatives that work at the store that I work at. They're all still somewhat trying to make something. Uh, there's quite a few law students as well. I don't know why. It law seems students? Like, law students. And there's uh, someone I work with. She's finishing the week that we're recording this podcast now. She finishes and she's starting a job as a receptionist at solicitors with the view of starting an apprenticeship there. Interesting. I'm not sure what it is, but there's quite a lot of law students. Mm. And people are interested in law and criminology and things like that. It's quite interesting, actually. Just a, a little t like brain tweak then. It was like... The diversity of the people that work in these supermarkets. Right. Yeah, it is. I've never thought about it really because I've always just, you know, I, I've worked in a lot of these sort of like supermarkets, retail based sort of em like employment, but I've never really thought about the background of the other people that work there. And a lot of other people there have got, you know, other ambitions, other drives, but the diversity of that is fantastic. Like I've, I remember um, my previous job before going full time as an artist. Uh, I worked with a guy there who was a trainee police officer and he was working at cost cutter with me doing like 40 hours a week in uni farm. And it's like really interesting, like the conversations that we had about um, studying law. Cause I, I know a little bit. I think most of us know a little bit about law. We'd like to think so. Don't break it. That's all you need to know. Very much so. Unless you need to for a photograph. Anyways. Uh, <laughs> In a very limited and specific way. Yes, of course. And you must have your press card and be careful and all those things. Yeah. <laughs> Wear a mask. Wear a mask. <laughs> Wear a mask. <laughs> but yeah, I remember the conversations we had and they were so like interesting about talking about law and all these other aspects and it was it took away from the the day-to-day -day grind Definitely of is. you know going in clocking in da, 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 and then leaving again you know do you think you found something like that at Sainsbury's definitely and it's it, just talking to anyone about anything besides the work that you're doing does make the shift go faster mm. even if it is like really dumb things there's someone I'm working with he's like he's a twig mm. like me and he's like oh I'm trying to bulk up so he's just like inhaling cookies and things like that, <laughs> drinking monster energy. Like, I think that'll help. And then you've got people there that know what they're doing. He's like, no, that's not how you do it. You do it like this. Yeah. It's basically free help. Yeah, yeah. And you've got, there's a few gym rats. We've got, I work with a Venezuelan. He's really funny. He works two jobs. I'm not sure what his other job is. Interesting. But you do sort of start to paint a picture of these other people. And you know, at the end of the day, a lot of them are trying to leave. Mm. <laughs> Most mm. people are, I think, are under 25. Yeah. And they are trying to leave and I think that's why well that's obviously why retail has such a high turnover yeah definitely and it is good if you're in a situation like as a student you need a few hours a week like 12 18 hours to help you pay rent or just mm. to get a bit on the side to have a social life mm. that's how it was for me in my second year mm. yeah because you studied at uh, Ravensbourne right yes yeah what was it like I'm not going to talk bad about it it did have its issues but every university has its issues of course uh it got better. It certainly got a lot better as the time went on. Mm. And the first year was obviously it's an introductory year. You don't really take anything seriously. No one does. No, of but course. You, don't, you try your best. You learn the ropes. You play about. Second year, 
I didn't have a place to live in London. <laughs> so I was living with my cousin who in Seven Oaks, who let me live rent free so long as I paid for my food, looked after the house, and mm. I paid for my transport there and back. Mm. And the train in from Seven Oaks to London, which I'm eternally grateful for. Yeah. Because that helped me graduate with the first class. Um, but then in the third year, I had a place in the Isle of Dogs, which meant I was right in the middle of London, close to uni, took 20 minutes to get there and back. Mm. Massively beneficial in terms mm. of work. Mm. Even though I didn't get any possible, even like any paid work in my third year, which is annoying because a lot of people that I knew did, you yeah. know, I was doing the same thing as them and applying for the same jobs. Yeah. It's the luck of the draw. Yeah. But being in central London allowed me to shoot more work that I wanted to do on my own terms. I did get paid work, actually. I totally forgot. I was working as a production, not production assistant, a locations assistant. Interesting. In, in yeah. In okay. Yeah, because I was going to say, like, be, living in that. central London must have been, you know, quite... A, quite interesting just from the people that were out and about on the street but Absolutely. also you know the aesthetic of central London is very interesting as well so like and did that sort of play a big factor in like your inspiration for the work you're making I'm guessing when I first started at university so I graduated graduated I left college at Plymouth with a distinction and I wasn't entirely sure what it was I enjoyed doing there mm. But the final major project that I shot there was a really weird, trippy video. As like, a, I was trying to be all poignant and yeah. like experimental and say, oh, I'm moving from one part of my life to another. So I'm going to do glitches in high collapse videos of Cornwall and then Plymouth. And then I'll go to London and I'll shoot some there. Yeah. And then alongside shooting that, the video, I was shooting some personal work. And I thought, oh, I quite like this. So mm. this is like mostly architectural, fairly boring stuff. Mm. focusing on the construction side of obviously London was and sort of still is experiencing a construction boom mm. fueled by Chinese and Russian oligarch money yeah and massive towers that won't ever be inhabited by anyone for about 50 years and they'll soon be demolished and replaced by something else yeah uh, but I it was really cool going from living in Cornwall to living in London it's such a such a difference mm. and it's like oh and it's to capture the main thing that was different is everything was a much taller yeah 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 true. i've always been a bit of an architecture nut as well mm. and so, i think that shows in your work yeah <laughs> i like to think so uh so i ended up, i just wandered around london a lot of my time was in the first year just exploring mm. photographing absolutely everything especially construction i'd upload the photos of the construction stuff to a forum didn't even do it properly <laughs> i just put it on a forum <laughs> um and it was this really badly processed black and white because i thought I'm a first year student study photography. I know absolutely everything I need yeah, to know. Yeah, Therefore, yeah. black and white, portrait format, purist, that's it. <laughs> yeah, it, was, it didn't look good. And it's still done it. <laughs> it. I thought it looked good then, but looking back at it now, God, it looks awful. Yeah. But then the second year, I sort of stepped back a little bit. I wasn't shooting as much. I was focusing more on, well, going to and from my cousin's house and then to and from uni and then mm. to and from home to work at Sainsbury's at the weekends mm. and then coming to back up and do it all again. That's it's a crazy. crazy trip. It's uh, it certainly slowed down my process. Yeah, yeah. But it did give me some more time to start shooting, well, locally in Taunton, mm. as well as in London. I didn't have as much time to explore places, but it did sort of develop my practice a little bit. I stopped shooting in black and white. Mm. I think there was about a period of four or five months I didn't shoot a thing, and I approached it with a clear head. Started shooting in colour. Still quite ugly processing, but it was shooting in colour. Certainly a change and shooting in a lot more of a deadpan style mm. rather than just taking pictures of cranes <laughs> steel work <laughs> as uh, i remember i shot a project one of the projects this is one of the bad things uni one of our projects was three months long split into three separate bits it was to do with advertising so okay. we had to shoot billboards style ad shell style things alongside a promotional video for something to do with the river thames interesting I can't remember the ins and outs of it anymore. I've chosen to delete it from my memory. <laughs> but I remember I went with my friend, Quinn. Hi, Quinn, if you ever watch this. <laughs> um, we went to Tilbury, East Tilbury, which is like a tiny village to the east of, understandably, Tilbury. Yeah. It has a fort there, which is one of the Napoleonic Palmerston type forts, which was mm. designed to defend the, uh, the estuary. That's the word. <laughs> and so we went to film that. But on the way back, towards the train I remember we stopped off at this used to be a shoe factory one of the biggest shoe factories in the country mm. it's been turned into housing and things like that I think that was probably one of the first times I started shooting in a more deadpan style of things that were already built 
mm. and in just more of the aspects of life mm. rather than things being made and then it sort of went from there and then third year I just went and did everything <laughs> so do you think you're like because you do have quite a style to your work now of what I've seen anyway it's, it's very um, yeah it's got somewhat of a deadpan aesthetic to it fell in um, love with the deadpan aesthetic yeah but it's like do you think that's where it sort of developed was that time obviously studying you find you I think I don't know if you'd agree but for me it was a case of like I found my rhythm of what I was interested yeah, in definitely. Um, and then that was just personified when I did my masters of course but do you think being in London in that time of your life was kind of what helped like find your style and your your interest and and especially in architecture because as you said like london is, is it's a bit of a playground 100 percent, 100 percent. i think it's it's an architectural playground i remember i wrote an article in my school newspaper about seven years ago now about london being the architectural playground of the world mm. it's all coming back to me it's haunting <laughs> uh, but no yeah it's definitely london has definitely sh shaped the way i shoot Obviously, mm. you're exposed to everything. You've got all the different cultures, you've got all the different galleries, you've got all the different styles of photography, all the, the other industries related to it, the printing, mm. the advertising, the agencies and things like that. And then there's the street side of it. There's the street art. Have you ever been to Leak Street? Um, no, I, I haven't spent a whole lot of time in London, surprisingly. Leak Street, the graffiti tunnel underneath Waterloo. Okay. Like, it's constantly getting out there. It stinks of fumes. And it's really cool. And then you've got all the Shoreditch, which is the really trendy part. Mm. didn't like that so I like being there more than shooting that yeah yeah and it's yeah I think it definitely helped and then being at university as well being exposed to you're in a group with 60 other photographers you obviously draw inspiration from some of them mm. got a friend of mine Nico who's a street photographer and I didn't necessarily like street photography and I don't really like it now but he definitely is one of the exceptions because mm. he does it in a way that I think is different and true to the actual term of street photography it's candid Yep. And it just looks, well, captures London as it is. Mm. But he's moving on to something similar to what I do now, which is interesting to see. And you know, like, I'm sort of like fawning over the work. He <laughs> shoots it on 35 millimeter and medium format film. It's like, I need to do this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's interesting, man. Like, I, I totally agree. I think like exposure to new inputs is so important as an artist like massively like, definitely because i think it, it it helps to form our creative processes and our creative thoughts massively like you know that's why reading books in our realm photo books is so important to sort of continue that constant creative evaluation i think definitely but then also obviously right now is a bit more tricky but going out and exploring and feeling new things and uh, you know for myself i i photograph a lot under emotion like it's really interesting how different people produce work and what they see in the world because yeah. i look at the stuff that yourself produces especially your architectural work and it inspires me to reevaluate my art like the way i look at the world you know because uh -huh. we're all different and yeah. that comes from comes from uh the experiences that we've had i suppose but like i'm really interested in because I've obviously I've looked through your work, etc. But there's no portraits. Like none of your work has any portraiture. A lot of people have pointed that out. Okay. That's semi-intentional as well as intentional. Mm. No. Intentional and disintentional. Intentional and disintentional. That's yeah. it. Yeah. And it's more of the fact that when I was in London, we her. Uh, I just hate taking portraits. Basically, <laughs> too long didn't read. I don't like taking portraits. It's something that I want to change. Okay. I am planning a project which will involve portraiture and I want to obviously build a rapport with people and get in contact with them before. Because mm. at uni, a lot of the times we had a few like candid street photography workshops as well as uh, we had Leica masterclasses which we signed up mm. for and sometimes did, which were interesting. They were very fun. I didn't necessarily like the portraiture aspect of them. Mm. It's the idea of going up to someone in the street yeah. and asking them for their photograph. It just feels so unnatural to me. Mm. And it's just like... Mm. And then it, I think you can get away with telling a story without showing the people in it. Yeah, yeah. I definitely think there's there's an argument there for sure. I think it's really down to the story that's being told. Definitely. You know what I mean? So like, for example, the work that you had up in the recent exhibition here is that like... That would not work with portraits. No, if you had put a portrait in that, it would actually be a bit discouraging. Like you would <laughs> sort of look at the work and it would, it would feel so out of place. It would be jarring, yeah. Very much so. And I think... Portraiture is a weird one in photography because it's strange because 
the reason why I know personally, I noted that you don't do a lot of portraiture is not from the physical thing of it. Like there is none. It's because I felt the same way towards portraiture. Yeah. Like I don't overly enjoy stopping people on the street to ask their pictures. I don't overly enjoy portraiture full stop. I'm the same way. Definitely. But there is something very intimate about it. And that's something that's always, for me as a photographer, I've always been interested in, you know, especially building relationships with, with subjects. Yeah. Like I'm, as I said, I'm not a fan of stopping people on the street or even necessarily candid images of people on the street. Cause that's a whole different realm. And it, you know, that's another conversation. But for me, if I'm shooting portraits, I want to get to know the person before I make that image because I want to actually try and reflect the person that I'm capturing rather than the moment that it's in. And it's interesting you say that you're transitioning into doing potentially something I, I like that. I say transitioning into doing it. I'm planning on doing it. Yeah. But I think I'm still sort of averse to the idea of portraiture because was it, this is, at university, it was fairly commercial orientated. Of course. So the portraiture we were taught how to do was very much, you go in, you set up your camera, you set up your flash, two minutes, person comes in, mark cross, take yeah. the photo, they go away. Yeah. That's it. It's very corporate, very bland, very sterile. Yeah. No real soul to it. I like portraiture if it's environmental, something like John mm. Tonks, the way he mm. works in Empire. Mm. That's something like that I find much more enjoyable. But then again, I just find portraiture is, there's an epidemic in portraiture as well as in the world right now mm. the portraiture is bland i mm. think there's nothing really that stands out to me as being good however i don't know sometimes it with another image it works yeah if it's paired with something it works a lot better than if it's just a standalone portrait mm. i know alice tomlinson i don't know alice tomlinson but i know she did a body of work about i think it's called lost summer or something like that so there's pictures of teenagers who are meant to be going to the prom mm. or graduating university this year and I'm looking at it, it's like, yeah, it's a great story to tell because it's relevant and it's current and people look back at it like, oh, that's the thing that happened. That's really important. But it's just black and white portraits of people. Like, what's special about the pictures? Mm, mm. Yeah, it's, it's not disrespecting Alice Tomlinson's work at all. Alice Tomlinson's great. No, of course, of but course. I just don't think, as an example of portraiture, I don't think it's very good. Yeah, I think it's very subverse in that some some form of portraiture it's uh, it's similar actually for myself that some forms of portraiture i find really attractive and, and my eyes naturally drawn to it yeah i speak of alex all the time because he's like he does it so well he does it beautifully his work his portraiture is i personally think fantastic because it does tell the story of the subject that's in it it's very environmental as you as yeah. you're sort of saying but yeah it, there is a flood of especially I know we've had a similar conversation to this in the past but like Instagram I don't know what's going on upstairs yeah someone's getting stabbed I think, I yeah. think potentially <laughs> I hope not because I might ruin the podcast <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so apologies to the viewers watching or listening um, there it seems to be something someone's getting involved up there yeah something's happening upstairs um <laughs> I hope it's not what I think it is. Sometimes these podcasts are unpredictable. <laughs> oh, it's stopped. Hey. He's, they finished. No, they haven't. Oh, no. It's <laughs> second round. Um, <laughs> whoever anyway. it is, they got a fast rebirth. Anyways. Um, <laughs> this is going to be really awkward if people can't hear that. <laughs> We're talking, just talking about it. It'd be so weird. <laughs> You want to have uh, some soundproofing on your roof. Honestly, I'm, I'm toying with building a booth here. So like once we can actually sit closer together <laughs> rather than two meters away, and that sounds weird with the noise going on in the background, um, we what? can just soundproof this whole space, yeah. hopefully. But yeah, at the moment, we've got to deal with whatever that noise was. <laughs> I hope it's not what I think it is. Anyways. Portraiture. Portraiture. Back up. Thank you, Ryan. <laughs> We're back on subject. Um, yeah, I think we've had this conversation before about like Instagram and social media, and there seems to be right now a current theme with portraiture for uh, on social media. You either shoot it on 35mm film, normally Kodak Portra. I've shot a shit ton of that film in the past. It's a no beautiful shame. film. No 100%. Um, or it's shot on... 
uh, iPhone with a film filter, and that's kind of how it all looks. It's all got a very similar color palette. Yeah, you, you, iPhone ultra wide. Yeah, you need some neon lights. Yeah, somewhere in there. Can Refle- you tell I've tried jumping on that bandwagon? <laughs> <laughs> Reflection in the window. You're missing yeah. the window. Um, yeah, you missing need to get. Uh, I need to be a woman. I need to have very long hair. Yeah, we can change mat- that. Matte mat skin. Yeah, uh, and round glasses. Yeah, give me your glasses. <laughs> <laughs> It's a trend in that. I know. I know a photographer that used to basically their entire first year of university was that. Mm. And like, I don't know what he's doing now. <laughs> he left in the second year. Mm. I think that's the thing though. It's like, it is easy to fall into trends because like... People like it and you get validation when they like it. Totally. And that's the weird thing about this is that we're talking about not joint jumping on bandwagons and trends but then it's so easy to do so it's so easy to fall into that category there's nothing wrong with jumping on a bandwagon on trend if you're learning yeah because it gives you experience and new things but once like i say there's a point maybe two or three years in or if you've progressed you feel like you've progressed enough to try new things and move on because that's how you develop isn't it you learn new things and you keep going and you don't stop sometimes you look back sometimes it'll work Maybe it'll work in the shoot that you're doing. Most mm. of the times, it's an exercise. Yeah, and I think that's the thing. Is like, it is all about learning from whatever experience. There's still something going on upstairs. <laughs> I hope they're learning from their experience. Anyways, um, <laughs> I think that's uh, that. At the end of the day, that is kind of the key out of this. I suppose is that, yeah, jumping on bandwagons, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, it is kind of important to creative practice in a way if you are learning from it but i think it's it's almost like trying to become anti i don't know if you would agree but like there's almost this like trying to become anti-trendy but becoming trendy by being anti-trendy starting a trend of being not trendy totally like obviously that's a big thing in the fashion industry the fashion world by being against fashion you're actually pro fashion yeah fashion world in itself (laughs) that's confusing but i think there's something to be said about that in photography in some ways because i think photography definitely there's parts of it that are very anti-trend but then they become a trend they become a they become something that people do to jump on a bandwagon you Mm -hmm. know and it's it's deciding whether to do it or not like i remember I remember a few years ago when black and white photography made a big comeback on social media and everybody was shooting black and white. Yeah, uh, I did exactly the same. <laughs> and I remember I remember going out and I was even making street images because that was the thing. Black and white street photography was all the rage like three, four years ago on social media, on, on uh, Instagram especially. And I remember going out and making images and being like, oh yeah, this is cool, uploading them, getting likes and having that validation. Um, And I look back at it actually a few days ago. So every year I go back through all my social medias and I basically blank slate them or I take everything off to a point where I'm happy, if that makes sense. So old photos, et cetera, et cetera. Um, And I went back through my Instagram and you know, the archive, you can archive your stuff. I went through my archive and there's a point, you can see it on my archive where the final black and white image finishes the, on the Instagram and then something completely different starts because in that moment I just thought, fuck this, I'm fed <laughs> up of following this trend and I'm going to do something else. And it is really interesting having this conversation now because it reverberates with me because I am I think I'm in another one of those positions as a photographer where there's a, a there's projects that I want to produce, but every time I go to start them, I start to think about things that are kind of trendy at the moment. And naturally I'm like, oh, actually I want to make that. You okay? It's bourbon, yeah. <laughs> Mate, just <laughs> let it out. <laughs> um, and it's like, it's so frustrating because I'm castrating myself as an artist right now from making anything. Because every time I go to make it, I look at it and think, oh, that's shit. Because I'm not thinking it's okay you know what i mean it's really weird I think you're better off in situations like that is what i found is work especially with the uh the zine mm. i'm making you just shoot mm. shoot absolutely everything process it how you want mm. and come back to it mm. then you call it mm. and then it will something will work if you're shooting a new project just shoot and then shoot and then shoot and mm. then do it some more mm. and then organically 
something will come of Organically, it. Organically, something will come of it. Yeah, I think that's the thing is I haven't been shooting enough. Like I know, I know that like I really haven't been shooting enough. Like I, I've gone back into shooting a bit of film recently. Um, only thirty five mil Fuji film. Like it's nothing amazing. Nothing like amazing. no, and but it's still slowing that process down again. You know, I've started to like set stuff on tripods and like really trying to force myself to slow down a bit more and it is helping mm-hmm. um and there is like as i said projects i want to work on but it's now just a case of figuring out the approach and i don't know if you if you you've ever had this with a project especially starting a project and one that you've had some success on like uh you know f- from going from a project that's done well and had good exposure exhibitions whatever to then start a new project, whether it's long-term or not, is a really weird process because you naturally want to start making images similar to the previous project because you know that that did well. Yeah. And I'm really trying to not do that right now. So I'm like purposely going back through my work and looking at it and going, okay, what are the common tropes in this project that I should potentially avoid in this next one, you know? Mm-hmm. And do you, do you find with yours, because obviously a lot of yours is architectural, like it's easy to fall back into what you did on something previous definitely i think the main thing that i've avoided is black and white which, mm. is, which i'm very glad with yeah uh i don't really know because i'm the project that i'm planning at the moment isn't really architectural mm. it's more of a sort of documentary style now i have tried to move towards a documentary style rather than just straight up like the mm. scenes mm. mainly photographs of houses with a few trees in it um i don't really know how to answer that one well i'd argue i'd argue you already shoot in a documentary style yeah like i've had this conversation with mike who was who's my business partner at coverless you i think have you met mike i haven't met him but i know coverless yeah well actually saying that you were in our last zine weren't you I've, I, I always forget about that how can i um but yeah when he came on the podcast a few weeks ago i had this conversation I get really, I get a little bit frustrated because documentary style and documentary photography, people assume that they're one in the same. I don't no, believe there's a style of documentary no. photography. There's obviously a common trope. Documentary photography is the act of going out and documenting something in your way. Yes, most definitely. But there's no style, absolutely. No, but then there is trends. You know, there's trends within documentary photography, the the portrait of 400. Uh, the portrait diptychs. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So it's like, it's really easy to fall into that trope again. So definitely. maybe that's the documentary style per se. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I would argue that you already are shooting in a, a documentary format because you are documenting what you see over especially an extended period of time. But maybe, you know, for yourself, it sounds like you're wanting to change the process, change the approach of what you're doing. Definitely. I want to explore. I want to spend more time in one place in particular, but explore more things within that one place. Mm. I don't want to give too much away. No, of course, of course, of course. Um, but it will be in Cornwall. Mm. And obviously, if you know a lot about Cornwall, there's no money and there's no work. Yeah. It has happened, and I want to photograph what's happened. Mm, mm, yeah, Cornwall's, read, yeah. <laughs> Cornwall's a weird part of the country because it's, <clears throat> it's beautiful on so many levels, and it's amazing for about three months of the year to visit. To visit, yeah. Yeah, but outside of that, it's a really difficult place to be. Try but, living there for 15 years. There you go. <laughs> like, <clears throat> I think that's the thing that makes it I think interesting. If you, if you grow up there, you have an appreciation for the place in all times. Obviously, in mm. the summer, it's really nice. Mm. It doesn't get too hot. It doesn't get too cold. Mm. Obviously, when the sun's out, you go to the beach. You go to a quiet beach, avoid all the emmets, all the tourists. Yeah. And like, it's probably the best place in the world. I'd say it is the best place in the world. But then come the winter, when the tourists go away the rain comes in, it gets cloudy, it gets overcast, and it's just nice in itself, because obviously you have it mm. to yourself. You go for a walk on the moor. I used to do this, go on the moor, go up onto the moors sometimes, soaking with, soaking wet, chucking down with rain, you get soaked mm. right through to the bones. It's really cold, but it's great, because it's like, it's you and no one else for miles. Mm. Mm. That's, what I ended up, that's what I ended up doing for my final major project at uni. Uh, I wanted to go in the springs, I wanted the weather to be fairly nice but not so nice that it's just sunny and photographing nice yeah. parts of cornwall in nice weather which is what everyone seems to do yeah it's very touristy 
Uh, no, the weather was crap. Mm. It was snowing. It was hailing. I got caught in the moor. I was sheltering in an old engine house <laughs> to avoid hail. His feet were wet. Shoes were leaking. It's quite <laughs> Didn't even like the work I was making as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Until I looked at it last year, at the end of last year, and thought, okay, I've got something, I've got something I can use as a basis here. Mm. Which is where the rest of the project is coming in. Oh, okay. So do you find that looking back to your own work is like, for me, I find it really quite inspirational to myself to be like, oh, okay, I liked this part of this project. Maybe I can build off of it visually. Is it similar? Like, I know some of the creators are like that. Yeah, I think the, the last year, was because I wasn't able to really go anywhere and shoot anything. I thought, so like, archive. Mm. Print everything off, contact sheets of absolutely everything. It took days sort it all out into different piles what project is what different types and whatever and then a uh, photographer I know Robert Law from yep. uh, Anglesey he did a talk for the RPS and he mentioned about organic editing and organic processing and whatever mm. if you look at if you lay it all out like that you'll see projects start to emerge from the work that you're making and it just generates even more ideas that you didn't even realise you had mm. yeah I think that's like it goes back to, I suppose, what we were saying about constantly being um, in the loop of looking at new work and, and, and exploring because that's the way of like the creative process, I suppose, for a lot of people. And for me, I, that's the one thing I haven't been doing anywhere near enough of is actually looking at creatives and looking at creative processes, which is strange because I run the shows and stuff here. So it's yeah. like... I'd look at creative stuff every day, but I don't look at it with the intent of like uh, the emotion that it brings to me as a per as an artist personally. I look at it as the what could it bring to the town, what could it bring to the community, etc. And yeah. it's it's a different. If you ever go down that line of work, you'll I'm sure you might uh, understand it, or you might already. But it's a different approach to looking at artwork because you're not looking at it from a, a personal growth you're looking at it from a what can it do to help people uh, it's, it, yeah it's really interesting yeah. actually um, I, I'd like to sort of, I don't know talk about it more in depth because I, I'm still so new to this you know I've only been doing this three months being a curator I'm not even sure I can give myself the title of curator um, curator in waiting yeah curator in waiting or call myself the assistant curator like, waiting <laughs> yeah curating um but yeah it's definitely different um and <coughs> it's something that i'd like to explore more of mm -hmm. um but yeah i don't know where i was going with that tangent i was going somewhere it out. It, yeah it got to the end of it i mean <laughs> i don't know about you but I'm so like tired and exhausted with everything right now outside of my creative process and the brickworks. Just the fucking world, man. Never like, in my life have I napped so much. Really? I never used to really nap. I used to nap every now and then at uni. And then come the third year, it was a common occurrence. Maybe mm. once, or, once or twice a week. And now, normally, I get home from work, sit down, 20 minutes to sleep. Flat out, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, not even, it's not even, I say retail work's not hard. It isn't hard, it's just stressful. Yeah. Given all the restrictions and the rules you have to follow, mm. and it's only for six hours. But if you're doing that, I'm really making it sound like I'm not very good at the job. <laughs> Hopefully, Sainsbury's don't hear this. <laughs> uh, I'll tag them on Twitter. <laughs> Mike Coop. Yeah, listen to this. <laughs> One of your employee. <laughs> I know. Everyone, well, everyone handles the stress of work and life and the situation that we're in differently. And then if it means I come home after a six-hour shift falling asleep then so be it mm. i'm not going to moan at anyone who doesn't do that if anyone no, wants to moan at me they're welcome to but it's going to do this mm. Mm. <laughs> why would it bother me yeah i think uh, yeah everyone's living their own life right now you know what i mean it's it's I'd, uh, I'd, i don't want to go down the pandemic because i speak about that like every day but yeah. <laughs> it's like it's unavoidable uh, moment, it? it is it really is well, and it's like the last thing I wanted the, the Brickworks podcast to turn into was like the pandemic show. It hasn't. It's obviously a talking point, but it, it, it's such a big part of life right now and will be for the foreseeable future. It's like, but it's fucking exhausting. Like it genuinely is exhausting constantly dealing with it. And I'm like, I, I don't know about, by the sounds of things, you're, you're the same, but like I get home and I'm, just completely drained. I try and, well, I say try and keep my head up. Obviously, my head's always up. 
Mm. If it gets too low down, that's it. I'm gone. Mm. But yeah, I, I have snapped a few times at work, and I always try to avoid. Obviously, you try to avoid doing that. I once. <laughs> this is a story. Uh, so right at the beginning of the pandemic, it's April, I think. There was a coronavirus support page for my estate that I live on. So I joined okay. that. I wanted to see what's going on. So I saw a few people were posting things about Sainsbury's. So I was like, oh, get in there. I want to see what's going on. I want, yeah. to, I want to see what they think. Yeah. And then I saw someone was posting uh, every morning. They'd come in. Well, they wouldn't come in. They would post, like, stock levels and how busy it is and things like that. Mm. Fair enough. Right, great. So I thought I'd do that. So one day when I was on my shift, went to the toilets, did a little post. Mm. And I thought, you know what? I'm stressed out. I'm going to pop off at the manager's. Store manager lives in my state. Was in that group. No. <laughs> yeah. Um. So I got called into her office, but fortunately, I didn't get sacked. Even though it is a sackable offence for breaking social media policy. Yeah. And it wasn't a personal attack at her. It was just the management. Yeah. Yeah. But they weren't doing enough then. Yeah. And I had enough. And that was in April. Mm. <laughs> that wasn't even that far into it. No. But then they explained to me everything that they were doing. And they thought, it's a stressful time. I know you're not the sort of person to do this. And I know you're good on the estate. See you out and about. You pick this and things like that. We're going to let this go. I was like, okay, fine. Mm. And then, obviously, since then, nothing has changed. Yeah. And I'm so, so very tempted to go and talk to someone about it. And I've mm. gone up to managers and said... Tier three now, what are we going to do? Tier four now, what are we going to do? And then they said, we're waiting for something for higher up. Where like, oh, are you now? Mm. And then it's like, really want to say something. But yeah. I, I can't really say something because it will look bad on my mum who works at the same store and does the same shifts as me. Yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> so um, I'm sort of in a tight situation. And I am desperately looking for an help. I've been applying for jobs like there's no tomorrow. Will I get them? Probably not. Mm. But at least it can give me a bit of hope. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's all you can do right now is like just keep looking out for things that might tweak your interest in some capacity. And it's very restricting around here. It's like, this is what I was talking with you about. It's a bit of a dead zone. Mm. In terms of creative work, at least in the Somerset, yeah. not that much. I applied for a job in Columpton, mm. working as a studio assistant in a food photography for social media thing. Okay. Like, I know that's not what I do. I don't particularly like studio work. But no. I can do it. I'm quite, I've got the degree to prove that I can do it. Yeah, you have the qualification. And if, I, if needs must, I will do it. And studio photography is not that bad. It's just not what I enjoy. Yeah. But then I don't know if I'll get that. I've applied for studio jobs before and they've never got back to me. Mm. I applied mm. for that job in Cardiff. I think Cardiff is the nearest, Cardiff or Bristol are the nearest two places which I think will stand a chance for hiring someone in my position. But then it's getting there. Yes, yeah, the commute. And especially right now, like commuting you know decent distance is a bit of a weird one i suppose i think it's at like, this point in time i'm quite happy to move out and move into a rented place already yeah not because i don't like living at home but no. like if the work is somewhere and i can afford to rent and live somewhere else mm. i would mm. no it's interesting you say that because like I, obviously i speak to a lot of creatives on a day-to-day -day and there's a lot of people in the same position that are just looking for an out looking for a a way to you know a get back to their creative process in a much more productive manner but also b work around creative processes in some capacity yeah because it's like yeah i could imagine working uh, in a job that one doesn't want to be working in right now is 10 times harder because you're having to work probably 10 times harder especially in something like retail you know it's it's people just people aren't trust me people aren't no no we are we've been well we've been pushed to but there's only so much that we can do there's only so much we can take mm. and then obviously if the store gets too busy we can't do our jobs because we have been told to leave the aisles yeah despite the fact that the store's too busy in the first place when it shouldn't be but that's not going to <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole nother like ramble and rant I'm going to put a pin in the Sainsbury's discourse. Yeah, we'll put it up there. Leave then, that there. <laughs> Let's go on to another rant, shall we? Magnum? Sounds good to me. All right. Fuck Magnum. <laughs> <laughs> well, that got it started quickly. <laughs> Mate, uh, yeah, Magnum photography... is dead, basically. Yeah. It's just a bunch of old men. Like, and a few women. Oh, well, yeah, of course. Mostly men, though. Primarily. It's, mm. Which is this? All right, so I posted on Twitter. Actually, yeah, you got into it a little bit, didn't you? I, think. No, I, mean, I started focusing more on Twitter after meeting with you the first time, and then yeah. I went to a talk by uh, 
Jack Lowe. I've forgotten his name this time. <laughs> I went to a talk at the Photo Book Club on Zoom about Jack Lowe and social media and finding your audience. And mm. obviously realizing that your audience is right in front of you. You don't need to pander to any algorithms. Mm. If you've got a following, pander already, to them. Yeah, They're yeah, you're like already your building that. Yeah. And like, I've been focusing more on Twitter for a few months now since about September. I'm getting somewhere with it. The very, one of the very first things that I saw was a Duck Rabbit blog. Mm. I can't remember his first name and I feel very bad for that. But he's been doing a very forensic look into Magnum. And it's about the same time that I joined Twitter. But back mm. then, they're obviously dealing with a lot of crap at the moment, mm. as in David Allen Harvey being a bit of a nonce <laughs> <laughs> in, the, in a roundabout way, um, abusing women, threatening women, and things like mm. that. Then you've got various other Magnum photographers who I didn't even realize were Magnum photographers mm. taking photographs of rape and child abuse and things like that. And having their photographs licensed with the rapes, rape, with the rapes, with the tags, rapes, and yeah, that's, I'm getting ahead of myself. You already, you're already going. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I th I've been following this for September. I've been wanting to weigh in and find, give my two cents on the subject. Mm. So, and then last week I finally did. I did like a seven tweet post about how I know Magnum. So I know Magnum from, uni from college. We were paraded around. Uh, we've got this book, big book of Magnum contact sheets parading yeah, around. Yeah. Like this is like the best of the best. And yeah, I remember there was a photograph. It's the photograph of Salvador Dali jumping with the dog in the things yeah, jumping yeah. in the air, things like that. That was my first experience of Magnum, and we were constantly we weren't really drip fed, but we were constantly reminded that Magnum, the best of the best, the photographers in Magnum are the best of the best. And I agree, some of them still are. I'm a very big fan of Mark Power. I was just thinking Mark Power. Yeah, <laughs> weird. Mark Power, I love his work. He's a Magnum photographer and it's great. But I've kind of lost a little bit of respect for him because he's been very quiet on the subjects of mm. obviously Magnum being problematic at the moment. But I went on this tweet rant and then it got shared. And I likened Magnum to basically the photographer's Bullingdon Club. Mm. It's a bunch of old, mostly white men. Yeah. Um, but you don't, and the initiation ceremony seems to be take photographs of abuse. Yeah. And yeah. get away with it. Yeah, Rather I didn't think of that. The pig. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't think of it from that perspective, like the initiation from it. And I don't think photographing the abuse and things like no, that. No, no, no. But I think there is a common yeah. trait there. There's definitely a common trait in that, like, you know, don't get me wrong. Some of my favorite photographers are in Magnum, like Alex. Alex so. <laughs> um, but there is definitely a common trait with regards to the the imagery that these photographers have created and per se got into Magnum that way. I think the whole, for me personally, I don't, I don't think I necessarily approach it in a similar perspective to you, but I understand the disdain towards Magnum in some context. For me, I don't believe in having one organization be the be all and end all. That's exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it just makes no sense, no. you know, especially, you know, of course, as we both reiterated during this whole podcast that, creative collaboration and research and uh, viewing new work is in, integral yeah. to growth. But why does it all have to be from one source? You know what I mean? And Magnum is, if you type in photography on Google, I think it's like the fifth or sixth search down from it. Quite possibly, I wouldn't is, be surprised. Yeah, it's Magnum or an affiliate to, that leads to Magnum. And it's, yeah, okay, that's fantastic that there is a group that has that amount of knowledge and has a huge library and all of these things, of course. But why is it only one and why is it very selective? I I, Magnum, they've had their day in the sun. Yeah. I completely understand why Magnum exists, mm. but it's a period and a product of a bygone era, especially in time and in photography as well. Mm. So a lot of the photographers in Magnum now, obviously they're still practicing, and it's only a few that are tarnishing the reputation it has because a lot of the photographers are very good. Mm. But it's the silence which is deafening mm. in this subject. Like, obviously, go back to Mark Power. It's nice. <laughs> totally. It was the arm, don't All worry. Right. It was the arm, don't you worry. Everyone totally. listening thinking I just fired. <laughs> I'm not that unprofessional, Ryan. <laughs> They've got Mark Powers because he's totally different work to David Allen Harvey. And mm. then you've got all these people like that. Olivia Arthur, who's, uh, I think, the chair chairperson? Yeah, I think chairperson. She's at the top. Yeah. I like her work. I went to a talk that she was involved in, 
and I find that the way she works, especially her work in Dubai, that's great. Mm. That's a, it's a completely different approach, which is something that I've tried to emulate before. Mm. But again, the silence is deafening. There's nothing from them, mm. Mm. which is a shame. And I, so I had this, um, was it after the tweet, I got a, a troll appeared. It's my first <laughs> internet troll, which means I've succeeded yeah. in annoying someone. It means you have actually achieved a level on Twitter. Yeah. Like. <laughs> They're basically saying that I disagree with all these photographers being put on a pedestal and it's like, oh, you've been growing up in a society where everyone's given an award. You're just too bad. It's like, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm entitled to be annoyed at the silence towards the, these issues. Yeah. And then obviously Robert Law, he did another tweet. He's been a very strong advocate of anti, well, not anti-Magnum, but boycotting Magnum until mm. they get their affairs in order. They got um, trolls as well. This mm. is last night. Mm. And we found out that they were just... Um, a teen or a young adult Republican out of their depth. <laughs> Why does that not surprise me? I don't know. But the, the one that trolled me was a, a photographer from Washington, D.C. And you go onto their website and it's just Nancy Pelosi. It's like, okay, I'm getting trolled by a presidential uh, governmental photographer. It's like, okay. Yeah, that's weird. That's very it was bizarre. But anyway, it happened. <laughs> but for me, yeah, Magnum is a product of a bygone era. I agree it does need to exist still once they get their affairs in order, but it should mm. exist as a heritage organization. Mm showcasing the best of the best at the time yeah because there's a lot of photography in there which is very good it's very poignant and it's key to the history of photography and the world mm. like the photos photographs of Salvador Dali the uh, kid in Vietnam with a gun pointed to his head yeah they yeah, are yeah, very yeah. important pieces of pieces of art photography documentary whatever you want to call totally. it totally but they have major issues which they need to sort out and the concept of best of the best needs to be spread out yeah rather than just being one organisation yeah, I totally agree, and I think it is. It's it's like the idea of um, the one business, uh, the one entity holding all the cards. It's like you don't want that in a creative process, and it's uh, sorry, a creative field, and it it no. creates this weird, constant dynamic of. I remember going to college, and yeah, similar story to yourself, where Magnum was somewhat put on a pedestal of this entity where you should aspire to be in Magnum. And for a long time, there was a, you know, when I was a younger artist, you know, I did feel like that. I was trying to create artwork that was potentially, um, you know, uh, challenging enough to get voices speaking, et cetera, et cetera. And then I, I came to the realization that I can't be fucked. I'm going to make what I like. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? And it's you like. You shouldn't have to aspire to be something if it's not who you are. Totally. And that's kind of how I feel towards Magnum is that it is a great entity. It is a great uh, organization in some contexts. But it definitely is the best of the best then. before. Yeah. Yeah, then. Rather than now. There is a myriad of fantastic photographers coming through from, you know, all age ranges at this point in, in their careers. And it's like, we need to be trying to bolster these individuals and these, and these creatives and create platforms for them to have their voice, which you see, don't get me wrong. There's collectives and all of these things, which but they all seem to be very mismatched. Though. Yeah. And that's not a bad thing by any means, but there needs to be greater collaboration and sort mm. of linking them up. So yeah, there's totally. the North Wales Collective, there's a South West Collective, there's a East Midlands Collective, yeah. there's a Scotland Collective. It's like, well, Scotland may be going away, Wales might be going away, but that doesn't mean that we don't have to, yeah. you know, collaborate. Mm. I mean, I'm sure everyone agrees. I like to think in the artistic community we're a bit more liberal, a bit more mm. free-minded, a bit more open-thinking. <laughs> I'd like to think so. I'd like to think so. <laughs> that's no way that any physical borders or boundaries or whatever could stop us from collaborating like that. Mm. Yeah, that's very true. And I think that's the thing, isn't it? It's like, uh, the thing that I've learned is, with starting the Brickworks anyways, is that you can just talk to people. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, <laughs> it literally is that simple. You know, we started the 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 Brickworks Collective. Go check it out if you're interested. Little pu little plug. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, we started the Collective and it's it's really fantastic to see we wanted it to be very multi, like oh, I fucking hate multimedia. I say it all the time, and I hate <laughs> saying that word. But it's, it's very mixed. Windows media player. Oh, don't like there's MP4 files. <laughs> oh, can I see your JPEG? Um, <laughs> How many megapixels? <laughs> <laughs> We're talking like Magnum now. Um, 
Oh, or camera clubs. Let's not go down that road. <laughs> um, but with with the collective, I wanted it to be mixed genre, and you know, it's it's that's the point in it. And it's like, yeah, we're photographers, you and I, but we're my I'm inspired massively by other art, and I'm sure yourself is in some context Definitely. as well. So let's try and look at photography as an art form because I get really annoyed when it gets pigeonholed into this commercial entity because it's it does, not, yeah, right. and it's like. Because at the moment, that's the only way people can see photography as a viable career, as it being a commercial entity. That's what the degree that I took was basically trying to hammer home. That you can't make money in photography yeah. unless you're a commercial, commercial studio stuff. And even though the lecturers that I was speaking to is like, eh, no, you're not. Mm. Have to. No, and that's the thing is I, that's that's come with the the, the evolution of smartphone photography, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I know, uh, and it's and it's pigeonholed photography into this weird. You must be commercial to make a living from this, which takes away from the art form that is photography. You mm. know, and that's what I'm trying to sort of push forward in my agenda my personal agenda is that this is an art form that's why um, god i keep Same punching time. the mic um <laughs> it's probably why i don't know if you uh, and some people pick up on it but i refer to myself as an artist rather than yeah. a photographer because i believe i'm an artist not just a photographer a photographic artist yeah a visual artist whatever the, the there's so many ways term. you call it yeah for, yeah definitely but for me I, I like to work inside of other realms and outside of other realms you know what I mean so I don't know it's a weird one and it's one that we could talk about for hours I'm sure hmm. um, but I feel like we would just end up ranting about photo clubs and that would be what I would do I'm going to go and take a photograph of the lighthouse oh Jesus Christ here we go <laughs> <laughs> and on that that note <laughs> where can people find your work man like where uh, whereabouts you on social media and all those I things I'm on Twitter which is I can remember my handle I can remember my handle <laughs> you got so, this Ryan Trow photo you got my website ryantrower.com I'm on Instagram but I don't use it just Oh, oh my god, I, I don't <laughs> use it properly so much anymore that I can't even remember the handle. And you'll find my Instagram through my link tree, which is in my Twitter bio. There we go, see. So they'll all be linked below as well. I will make sure I find all of them and I'll link them all below this podcast, whether you're listening on Spotify or watching on YouTube. Or I found out this podcast is on like Desert and Google Podcast. I don't know, how, I don't put it on there. I don't do you, know do, how it's. Do you use Anchor? I use Anchor, I yeah. Anchor does it all. Yeah, I, I only wanted it on Spotify and that was it. Because I personally, I listen to Spotify, most people do, or Apple like podcasts, but I can't be asked to deal with Apple podcasts. It's just a fucking nightmare to get <laughs> anything on there. Stop but yeah, the Apple Monopoly. Uh, Apple, oh, here we go, another one. <laughs> but um, yeah, so yeah, anyways, um, make sure you check out Ryan's work. Links are all down in the description. Um, and I appreciate you coming on, man, and You're having welcome. a chat. Thank you for having me. No, of course. Um, it's always good to rant about Magnum and not PI. Magnum dong. <laughs> <laughs> Got to end with a Magnum quote, you know how it is. Anyway, take care, guys. Stay safe in this crazy world we're in. And uh, yeah, appreciate you, man. Take care.